learn, live and learn, live and learn. Hi, my name is Barry Sterling Mitchell. Today is October 26th, 2022, and this is Ben and Barry on football. Hey, what's up out there, you guys? This is Ben Dickerson. I am your co-host. Let me give you some real quick information here real fast before we get started with this show. Number one, there are only two teams on bye weeks this week. For you fantasy guys that have players on these teams, be prepared to replace them in your starting lineups. That would be the Kansas City Chiefs and the Los Angeles Raiders. They are both on a bye. Kind of weird only having two teams on the bye this week, but yes, it's only two teams. They're from the same division too, right? Uh, that is correct. That's wow. kind of strange, isn't it? Okay, so now the next thing is baseball. The Philadelphia Phillies are in the World it. Series. And, you know, we live in Philadelphia, so I got to admit, I'm a Yankees fan, Barry's a Yankees fan, but if I was going to claim a National League team, it would probably be the Phillies. I don't want to be one of them people that's considered a bandwagon jump or, or you're only rooting for them because they're winning, because I do like the Phillies, but I am a Yankees fan. Now, that being said, there's two things Philly fans have to worry about, and I'm not hating. I want the Phillies to win. I'm rooting for them. But there's two things you need to worry about. Number one, you need to worry about the Houston Astros. They're really, really stacked, and they swept the Yankees. That's big, believe it or not. The number two thing is the last three World Series that the Phillies won, 1929, before the Great Depression, 1980, before a pretty bad recession and 2008 before another pretty bad recession. We could be in trouble if the Phillies win. <laughs> I knew you would love that. <laughs> and I, I think I saw a hint of it somewhere in the ether and I just kind of went by and I didn't pay much attention. Yes. But to hear those stats and to, you know, Macroeconomics is what I'm all about right now, you know. I mean, especially with the poli the politics, you know. Mm -hmm. I like when they want to blame Biden for the cost of gas. You know, <laughs> like, uh, you don't know about the Russian war. The third of the supply has been. I'm just off. saying, it just seems just one of those things, you know. <laughs> I'm like, come on, you know. It's like uh, he's been in a, around there a while. Gas was fine until the war broke out. That's your first hint. Didn't happen until after that. In any event, um, that's pretty cool stuff, Benny. And, you know, uh, on the side later, you, me and you can talk about the Yankees and what went wrong. Because, you know, I don't, you know, I watch the World Series. I don't really watch much behind that. So they didn't hit the ball. It's pretty simple. Well, yeah, especially uh, uh, what's his name, right? The our historical hitter, who oh, Judge? Judge. Yeah, he went completely cold. Yeah, so uh, it is what it is there. And then I didn't have a great weekend anyway with my team. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, thank you for the buy, and we'll remind people about the buy stuff. So make sure you guys check in because Ben's always dropping these little fantasy things. You know, my thing is Madden. Is this fantasy and uh, fantasy big? No doubt about it. Man, it's big. Um, but you got to be active in your fantasy. You got to be, you know, knowing what's going on. Who's who? What's yeah. what? What this status is? Blah blah blah. You know. So yeah, he brings that to to the show. Um, and uh, I don't know what the heck I bring. I bring something to the show. I bring a camera. Right? <laughs> um, but I did write. The intriguing game of the week for last week. I was looking for it. I couldn't find it. I don't know. I was probably drinking or something. We'll have to make sure that you find it. Um, was it the Bears game? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Please, let me just say real fast. I need to know what you wrote. You need to know what I wrote. I need to know what you wrote in respect to the Bears. Let's did look you, at it real quick. Did you quick. give the Bears any chance of winning that game? Let's look at it. Okay. Okay. So here's my website, um, sterlingnppr.com, short for sterlingnetpointpowerrankings.com. You'll know it when you see it, when you get here. And however you get here, if you look to the right, you'll see archives of older blogs. 
So I have them here. So the intriguing game, yeah. By Ben, bias plus score of 9.4 favored the New England Patriots. Right. Okay. So the Bears were, were heavy underdogs, you know, in terms of this. But as I said in the show, um, what I really wanted to talk about was the contrast and styles of, of you know, uh, of the quarterbacks, the Pats quarterback, Mac Jones, and, and Bailey Zappi. I missed out because I was going to make this a little heavier about Bailey Zappi. Okay. But then I kept reading about Mac Jones coming back. So I'm like, okay, well, he's going to play. So I don't want to go too heavy on Bailey Zappi. So I just included him because he, he was a focal point of this thing of, as to why I thought it was interesting in the first place versus okay. Justin Fields. And I wanted to look at the combination of the brain trust. We did a lot of work in the preseason talking about who these brain trusts were. So, you know, now's the time when you got, you know, a coach's group against another coach's group. And I'll be quite honest with you. I picked this as the intriguing game. The day after this game, this game was blowing up, man. People, people questioning <laughs> Belichick. <laughs> now they're looking at his record. <laughs> Without Tom Brady, like oh, he a 50-50 coach. <laughs> but yeah, um, as a matter of fact, what you were saying about uh this, I mentioned how extremely volatile it is. And I said I may be bad luck for the quarterback that I praised because uh, look what happened to Cooper Rush. <laughs> kind of gave him a little bit of a little bit of praise. Yeah, but he was due for praise. That didn't mean he was gonna be Philly, but up to well, that point. I'm just saying, once I praise you, you're yeah, doomed. Man, I, I guess you can look at it that way. <laughs> but he was, he that pr that praise was uh, well deserved up to that point. Well, the praise for Bailey Zappi was well deserved. You know, I mean, he came and he didn't have four up games. That he, had, point. he had two games, you know. And um, as I said, the, the Bears came in ranked eighth. Uh, week eight, excuse me, ranked 26 in that point. So they were minus 4.2, okay? 34, 31st in points four. So they were they were just scoring 15.5 points a game. So, you know, it didn't look good. <laughs> it didn't look good. Um, and then you've got uh, their, their leadership, Ryan Poles at GM, head coach Matt Eberflus, OC Lou Getze, I actually tried to tried to look up some Luke Getze college film. He was a quarterback and a kind of mobile quarterback at that in college. Um, they're DC Allen Williams and special teams coach Richard Hightower. So I talked a little bit about Justin Fields, and as you know, I I, I have a lot of you know, I've watched him and I'm I'm expecting big things out of him. Um, Getze had never been an offensive coordinator before. The head coach had never been a head coach before. Um, but Getsy was at Green Bay working with Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know how much coaching he really had to do. They might have been coaching him up. <laughs> but um, I do say at the end, this football season has been a clear example of parity. Almost no favorite team has gone unscathed. The Patriots are clear favorites with a bias plus reports at a score of 9.4. Vegas had the Pats at eight and a half point favorites. Let me point out again, when I looked at the bias plus for this coming week, out of all the games, there was only two that Vegas didn't agree with the bias plus. I'm, I'm amazed by this now that I'm taking a closer look. Bottom line, the Pats should win, but if you watch the Bucks lose to the Panthers and the Packers to the Commanders this weekend, you know it's no short thing. Quote, it's why they play the game. Boom. So, yes, I did. You right. know, I, it, it is what right. it is, man. And you can throw that other big phrase in there, any given Sunday. Any We've given seen Sunday. That. We've seen that quite a bit already. Sheesh, man. Well, okay. Let's go to the next part of the show, the Sterling Net Point Power Rankings, where we rank the teams by net points. By points for, points against, and average turnover differential. These are all be averages. This is how we do the numbers at this point. They'll all be averages. So let's get ready to go to 
Numbers 1 through 10. Again, Philly's the only undefeated team. Based on wins and losses, they are in first place. We rank by net points. Based on that, Buffalo's the team to beat. Philly at uh, Buffalo is average net points. And again, net points can be both positive and negative at any point. And also turnover differential, both positive and negative. And at any point in the season, half of the teams are in the negative. So that's, that's one of the amazing things that we got out of tracking this. And again, we just tracked this particular stat. This stat has shown itself to be, hmm, what's the word? Uh, <laughs> consequential. I'll put it that way. Anyway, mm -hmm. Philly's in second place, 9.3 plus 9.3 points per game. So that's their average net points, their average win margin. So Buffalo's winning by an average of 15.8 points, Philly by an average of 9.3. Kansas City, thanks to that beatdown on my Niners, are now in the third place with a plus 7.3. Cincinnati, who has really come around, Ben, I know you're going to tell us about that. Uh, fourth place at plus 5.9. And Dallas, Dak is back, rounding out fifth place at 4.3. So in the terms of the top five net points, anything you want to say real quick? Well, top five look like solid um, playoff contenders to me. I, I don't see any problems with any of these teams right here. Top five, that's pretty easy to call. These teams should hang on and, and do their thing for the entirety of the season and easily make the playoffs. Where they make it is the only question. What seed they come in is the only question. Okay, all right, all right. In the next group, six through 10, to me, there's two, three teams that I'm like, wow, these teams are up there all of a sudden. So first of all, Minnesota is not one of those teams. They're plus three and a half average net points at sixth place. Seventh place, this is one of the teams, the New York Jets, J-E-T-S at plus 3.1 average net points per game. They have a win margin going for them. And look who's tied with the Baltimore Ravens, the New York football Giants. Eight and nine, those in the, uh, the Giants and the Ravens at 2.9 net points on average per game. Y'all be winning them close ones, don't you? Cardiac kids. <laughs> and this is the third one. I'm like, okay, the young boys is moving up here. The Jacksonville Jaguars in 10th place at plus 2.6 points per game. So, again, those teams that maybe – like Jacksonville had struggled for years and they have a lot of talent sprinkled through their team. And now they have a coach. Uh, so keep an eye on those guys. And again, as you see at the bottom, average net points, points for. So that's all there. OK, let's look at the scoring leaders in terms of average points for. So this is the amount of points these teams are averaging. Buffalo, excuse me, not Buffalo, Kansas City is in first place at 31.9 points per game. Buffalo is in second place at 29.3. Vegas is in third place. I was a little surprised at that. They, people talk about Vegas like they aren't doing well this year, and maybe record-wise they're not, but they're there, 27.2 points per game. Philadelphia, 26.8 points per game. And this is another surprise rounding out the fifth place the Seattle Seahawks, 26.1 points per game, Benny. And last week I did apologize to Gino. I put it out in a pop. Apology to Gino. Um, and those guys are fifth place in scoring. So we'll stop there for a moment. Well, I'll tell you the truth. The Chiefs and the Buffalo Bills don't surprise anybody, nor would they have surprised anybody at the beginning of the season. The Las Vegas Raiders were expected to have a pretty good offense, started off the season not as well as people expected, but are now turning it on with their newfound run game. And Devontae Adams uh, is starting to feel it with his coach a little bit. They got off to a slow start as a, as a tandem. Uh, the Eagles were expected to be good on offense. They actually are. Seattle wasn't good to, expected to be good on offense. They actually are. Baltimore was expected to be good, maybe even better than they are shown here. 
But uh, New Orleans was a little iffy. Detroit started off well, they are falling, and Cleveland started off well, they are falling. Oh, I did the whole 10. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. But there's not a whole lot. Here's the thing. There's not a whole lot to say about the top five in any of these categories. I'm looking at them right now. Not a lot. But it's that second five who make up the top 10 where there's a lot of questions. A lot of questions. A lot of questions. I'll run through it real quick. Uh, points four. So we went through five. Six is Baltimore, seven is New Orleans, eight Cincinnati, nine is Detroit, and 10 is Cleveland. And, you know, literally I remember when Detroit was in first place and they moved from yes. like first to third, third to fourth, and now yes. they are down in ninth place. Their defense was the main problem, but their offense is flagging, as they say. Let's look at defense. Average points against. So you say the top five, now nah, we expected Buffalo, Dallas, Denver, Philly, and Tampa Bay. Buffalo uh, giving up 13 and a half points per game. Dallas 14.9. Denver 16.4, which to me has been, I'm going to mention this real quick. It, to me, is somewhat of an indictment of Russell. Your defense. From what? Uh, an indictment of Russell. Your defense is only giving up an average of 16.4 points per game, and you can't win? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying somewhat of an indictment. That's a big-time indictment. Big time, okay. But guess what? He's not on the hot seat. The head coach is. Sure enough, sure enough. Philly's in fourth place, giving up 17.5 points per game. And Dallas, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Tampa Bay is in fifth place, right behind them. 17.7, only two tenths of a point off of the Philadelphia Eagles. And people say, it's funny, everybody's talking about how great the Phillies defense, Philadelphia's defense is playing and how bad Tampa Bay's defense is playing. And they're only two tenths of a point off in terms of points allowed. <laughs> I love these numbers. These numbers are crazy. Congrats, Mr. Giant fan, in the top 10 with your New York Giants only giving up 18.6 points per game. If Danny Dimes can win games giving up 18.6 points per game, what the heck is wrong with Tom Brady and Russell Wilson, whose teams are giving up less? The Chicago Bars, 18.9, tied with the Cincinnati Bengals. My Niners have been falling. They were in first place. They're like they're moving down like like uh, Detroit did offensively. We're now in ninth place, averaging 19 points per game. And Jacksonville again in the top 10, defensively giving up 19.6 points per game. I'll just run the turnover differential real quick, and then you can close this out. Phillies in first place, averaging plus two uh, turnovers per game okay so that means they're taking it away if they take it away if they give it away once they take it away three times that's plus two there you go dallas second place 0.9 we got a 0.7 three times with arizona baltimore and minnesota so that takes you through fifth place a 0.5 twice with tennessee and buffalo tampa bay and the giants again in the top 10 benny they're giving up plus 0.4. So you got all these are in the plus range and Houston at plus 0.3. So there you are, your top 10 in net points, points for, points against, and average turnover differential. So uh, teams that we don't necessarily see in the average net points category, which is the very first column, we may soon see because they're holding on in the average points against and the turnover differential columns, okay? So if you see teams like uh, the Giants in both average points allowed and turnover differential being in the top 10, it's only a matter of, oh wait, no, the Giants are already there. I can't even use them as an example. Man, I'll tell you what a season we're having. This is great. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but take a team like yours, like San Francisco. Although they had faltered and had a bad weekend this past weekend, they're still sitting at number nine in average points against. And, you know, it's mostly injuries that's doing them in because man for man on paper, they have one of the top defenses, if not the top defense statistically. 
but uh, a bad loss can hurt you in these numbers things here. Uh, but as long as they continue to play well defensively, it'll do them justice as we get into the second half of the season. Uh, same thing with Tampa Bay. They should probably be holding on. And as soon as they get their offense going again, which I believe that they will, you will see them take a spot in that top 10 in average net points. Everybody else is pretty much where they should be. All right. There you go. Well, you said it. Up next, we have the next 10, 11 through 20. And as you can see on both the net points and the turnover differential averages, this is where we begin to enter the negative realm, the darkness. But at 11th place, we're in a positive 2.2 with Vegas. My Niners are right behind them in 12th place at plus 1.7. And New England in 13th place, plus 1.3. Tampa Bay is breaking even at zero from that point on it's all negative and this is one of the crazy parts about seattle because seattle is kind of like detroit in that the offense was lighting it up but apparently defensively they were giving it up so they're negative 0.4 chicago is negative 0.9 atlanta one negative 1.1 denver negative 2.1 so that means that russell is losing by an average of 2.1 points per game, even though they're only giving up 16. Tennessee minus 2.2 and Miami minus 2.6. So those are your net points from 11 through 20. You want to speak on that, on that before I move on? Well, just what I had said before, um, as long as teams like San Francisco and Tampa Bay can stay high in the average points against column, and continue to take the ball away more than they give it away, their chances of moving up and improving their offenses and moving up into the top 10 uh, will, will still be there for them. Team like Seattle, Seattle's scary, man. Here they are sitting at 15. Now, I remember early in the season, the Giants were around 13, 14, and 15. And we were like, oh, wow, look at them. It was a big, you know what I mean? It was a big deal. They've taken advantage of that and continue to improve and continue to win. Seattle, although a little bit later on, seems to be trying to do the same thing. They're hanging on there. Now, I don't see their defense. Well, we didn't get to defense yet. But I will say this. Seattle sneakily has a shot. The NFC West is not what we expected it to be. Seattle has a shot. Watch out. Ben. Seattle is in first place in the division. Thank you. Now, I don't know where they're – when I say they have a shot, I'm talking about where they finish. Well, but right now, they, absolutely, they're right in they, – They keep this up, they'll be there. <laughs> they're, they're in the thick of things, no doubt about no it. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. All right, points four. The Chargers, 23.4. They're in 11th place. 12th is Atlanta, 23.3. Well, it's, that's in Minnesota, 13th place, 23.2. So I'm a little surprised. Again, Kirk Cousins, 13th place behind Atlanta and the Chargers. They'll move. They're coming off a of bye week. They'll move. Okay. Well, averages, you know, averages is I average. get it. Yeah, we already calculated in the bye week there. But the Jets, 22.7. Arizona, 22.3. Jacksonville, 22.1. The Patriots, 22.1. That's 16th and 17th place. Your Giants, 18th place at 21.4. Just a tad above Miami at 21 even, and just a tad above my Niners at 20.7 points per game. So that's what that group is scoring there. Those are your mid to low 20s uh, in terms of scoring. Defensively, we're going from... 19.6 points per game with the Jets down to Houston at 22.8. Not a lot of spread there, but you have Minnesota, Indianapolis, the Patriots, Green Bay, boom, number 15, right in the middle of that. Rams right below them at 21 points per game. Then Carolina, Tennessee, Washington, and Houston. So those are your uh, points against. That's your defensive uh, scoring. Uh, rankings and then in turnover differential 
uh, pretty much everybody's really close. Um, 11 through 14. Point three points per game on the plus side for Atlanta, the Jets, Chargers, and Seattle. Chicago is point one. Those are all on the plus side. Kansas City and Cincinnati breaking even at zero. And then you have really negligible on the negative side for Jacksonville, Denver, and the Raiders at 0 0.1 uh, for Jacksonville and Denver and 0 0.2 for Vegas. So this is where the jumble is going to have to come from. Somebody's going to surprise from out of this area, this 11, between 11 and, and 20. Um, I'm obviously looking at uh, the Niners. I'm obviously looking at Tampa Bay. I'm possibly looking at a Tennessee because they're in a little bit of a weaker division. Um the trick to it will be to tighten up on the average points against and make sure you stay on the plus side of the turnover differential. That's a big deal. Those are things that can drag you under. So I, I believe that if those teams do those things, they'll be up in the top 10 where they probably belong. If they don't, then guess what? That means we were wrong. <laughs> but the numbers are never wrong. The numbers are what they are, you know. The numbers are what they are. So the numbers will prove us out to be. When I say we'll be wrong, well, I'm talking about myself and other people's thought process as far as who we thought were going to be the better teams in the league. Some of these so-called better teams have taken some bad losses. I'm not talking about, oops, somebody got them. I'm talking about, ew, that was ugly. Those well, that's aren't. What happened, that's what happened with my Niners. I posted. I said, "This is this yes." Is it was a, a sad performance, you know. Um, and I'll say this. I'll say two things. One, I think people are going to see now why the Niners reached for Trey Lance. They 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 saw there was another level um, of quarterbacking. That could be done if you had some additional mobility. And I still think that he's a Frankenstein uh, monster in the making. All right. But the other thing, <laughs> somebody posted Kirk Cousins numbers next to Jimmy G's. <laughs> and they were like, you know, and they were talking about why, you know, um, Shanahan, you know, even wanted Cousins. I mean, you know, the numbers aren't that aren't that different. And I mentioned, I said, well, Kirk Cousins is the crown, is the king of mind farts. Jimmy G is, is still kind of a peasant at mind farts, but he's he's rising fast in, in the, uh, the realm of mind fart royalty because, I mean, some of the throws he's, I've seen him over and over when that rushes on him, it's like, come on, dude, you can't do that. You, you know, I, we, we expect more from you than that. And so it's going to be really interesting. Again, I think he can run the offense, um, but they, you know, I personally think in terms of even McCaffrey, I think they should have focused on offensive line and making sure that they, they because you've got a guy back there that's not mobile. So you really got to make sure he's got a pocket and that he's got a few seconds to throw that ball. And I just don't think that they've done that. So there we go. That's going to be the challenge offensively, as far as I'm concerned, with my beloved San Francisco 49ers. Um, off defensively, you know, we still got some work, but we're up there. All right. So we, we talked about 11 through 20 defensively uh, from the Jets down to Houston and uh, average turnover differential from Atlanta down to Vegas. Anything else you want on this group? <laughs> No, I ain't going to say nothing. I don't know how we just went off on that Niners tirade. But I'll save my comments on that for later. Good stuff. Well, we're going to finish it out with 21 through 32. Net point-wise, everyone's in the negative. And same thing for a turnover differential. We're going negative. Cleveland, 2.6. And Green Bay, 2.6. Arizona, negative 2.9. New Orleans, negative 3.6. That's the same for Carolina and the Chargers. Rams are right there with that group, negative 3.7.
We always talk about neighborhoods. So look at this neighborhood here. Look at this group. They're all living together in, in this neighborhood of negatives. Green Bay, the Chargers, the Rams, you know. Indianapolis had an uh, interesting uh, thing happen with the quarterbacks. You, are you going to talk about that later? Green Bay? I'm Indianapolis. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, Washington at negative 4.4, Houston negative 5.2, Pittsburgh negative 7.9, and in last place, the Detroit Lions. And if you go one uh, column over, you'll see that they are also in last place and score in um, points for, oh, that's Denver. No, <laughs> that's not Detroit. Detroit, uh, that defensively, they're in last place, APA in the third column at giving up 32.3 points per game. But offensively, Tennessee, Dallas, Green Bay, Chicago. And uh, it'll be interesting to talk about that because I did, I got a, I got a uh, prediction from uh, one of our friends of the show, Mr. Mark Russell today on that Dallas game. Washington at 17.7. We got 17 point, I mean, 17.9. We got 17.7, one, two, three times with Tampa Bay, Carolina, and Houston. So nobody, I didn't expect that Tampa Bay would be scoring in the same realm as Houston. And I definitely didn't expect that the LA Rams would be below even that at 17.3 points per game. Indianapolis, 16.1, Pittsburgh, 15.8, and Denver. In last place, Mr. Russell Wilson at 14.3 points per game. You want me to pause or you want me to go ahead and knock the rest of it? Uh, you can keep going. You're really hard on Russell, though. I am hard on Russell. 21 through 20, 32 in terms of defense. Baltimore, 23. Pittsburgh, 23.1. That's 21st and 22nd place. I will just round it up. Your 20 average of about 23 to 24 points is going to get you from 23rd to 25th place with Miami, Atlanta, and Kansas City. 25th place, Benny, they played really well against uh, my Niners, but 25th place giving them 24.6 points per game. That's Kansas City right there. I've been You're talking a tough about one now. Defense. I've been talking about that defense. All right, we're going to see if they move up there. Yeah. Hey, Ben, well, remember it was about two or three years ago we were tracking some one team, and after the bye, they went on like a torrid. Yes, <laughs> that's happened a couple of years. Oh, man. Somebody it's, does all the time. Somebody always does. That's what I'm looking for. I'm, I'm looking for the team that, that where it clicks <laughs> all of a sudden. Vegas at 25 points per game in 26th place. Arizona, Cleveland, Seattle. See, there's Seattle's challenge right there. Cleveland and Seattle both giving up 26.6 points per game. The Chargers, we expected a little bit more, I believe, out of their defense and Absolutely. definitely a little bit more out of New Orleans defense giving up 27 and 28.6 points per game. And again, Detroit in last place at 32.3 points per game. Turnover differential all in the negative. Last place, the New Orleans Saints. Uh, Indianapolis at 31st and, and tied with Detroit at minus one. Everybody else is a fraction of one. That would be the um, going from 21st down to 29th. Pittsburgh, Miami, New England, Carolina. My Niners. Cleveland, Green Bay, Washington, and the Rams, all in the negative, but basically a fraction of a point. We don't get to a full uh, average turnover of one. I'm saying a point. I should say turnover. It's not a point. Detroit, um, one, and New Orleans, minus 1.4. So there you go. That's it for that. I'm good. Everybody's where they uh... – deserve to be by the way that they have played. Let's face it. Like Bill Parcells used to always say, your record is what it is. It tells you who you are. You are what your record says you are. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And in this case, we're not talking with loss record. We're talking net point record. Let's move on to the bias plus reports. Now, this is where we look at the matchups uh, between the teams that are coming up. And uh, 
get an idea of who's what we call favored. You never know who's going to win. We just talk about favor. And again, I'll tell you who's going to win. <laughs> Ben's going to tell you. <laughs> uh, By the way, I was I was ten and four last week. I'm on a roll. I was forty some percent again. 40. Yeah, That's I mean, when I say I the, the bias plus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, just just a lot of surprising wins. I mean, think about again the the, the Bears win. You know, and again. Most of my, uh, most of the bias plus favors were the same that Vegas was favoring. Right. So it's it had to have been a rough betting year for people. Well, Benny, this looks like the Thursday night game, kicking it off righteously. Ravens at Buccaneers, bias plus score of 3.2. Favors the Ravens. Ravens versus Buccaneers. Boy, I'll tell you. So there's a lot of volatility going on in the NFL, as we've already spoken of. Um, Here's two teams that have faced some adversity early on here. So Baltimore is now four and three. And in all three of their losses, they coughed up double-digit leads. But not last week against the Browns. They had a double-digit lead. They were able to hold on to it. Yeah, we're talking about the Browns, who actually helped the uh, the the Ravens. I was about to say the Buccaneers, who actually helped the Ravens with a couple of really really bad penalties down the stretch. So things with the Browns aren't real good, but we're talking about the Ravens right now. So let's stick with that. The Ravens were helped a whole bunch by the return of running back Gus Edwards. Pretty much Lamar Jackson was was handling this run game darn near by himself since the beginning of the season. Everybody was waiting for J.K. Dobbins to come back. J.K. Dobbins comes back from injury, doesn't look that great, gets hurt again, is probably out for the season. Now Gus Edwards is finally healthy. He made his first appearance this season, and he gave Lamar help on the ground, which he was needing really badly. In fact, Gus Edwards... And Lamar together outrushed Nick Chubb of the Cleveland Browns. So they did a really good job there and they pulled out the win. Holding on on defense, which they hadn't been doing, and getting a solid running game with help for Lamar. So that's a good formula for the Ravens. The Bucs Bucks have lost three of their last four. This is crazy. I can't remember. I think I saw somebody talking about they can't remember the last time that Brady lost two games in a row. Now they've lost three of their last four. It's not right in a row, but still not good. Uh, Things have been right, but I thought for sure this would be a get right game for them. Instead, they let a wounded team hang around and never establish anything to make the Panthers think that they wouldn't have a chance to win. They just hung around, hung around, no big plays, dropped passes, Drop touchdown pass by Mike Evans. All that let the Panthers believe that they had an opportunity. Once again, Brady threw the ball almost 50 times, but the offensive line couldn't run black, couldn't run block for, for a high school team. It doesn't get better with safety. I'm sorry, with the starting safety in both their corners getting hurt. Uh Winfield, Davis, and I forget the other guy's name. Um get the other corner's name, but all three of them are banged up. So the defense is looking weakened. The run game is looking like non-existent. I don't know what to say with the Buccaneers, but you always have to think that with Brady, they can turn it around, but I'm going to say Baltimore goes into Tampa Bay and wins that game. I'm going to take the Ravens. All right. Okay, Benny. So you're going to go with the bias. You're going with the Ravens. Yes, sir. Bias plus score, 3.2. Favorite, the Ravens. You know, somewhere up here, Benny, I had pulled up uh, the information. And again, as I was saying to you, um, most of the time, the uh, Vegas was going along with us. So I think Vegas is with us also uh, in terms of favoring the Ravens on this one. All right. Broncos at Jaguars. Jaguars are favored 
bias plus score four point seven. Not a big big one, but um, it makes sense to me. You know, it makes sense to me. But I hear that uh, that uh, Russell Wilson was on the airplane doing deep knee bends or <laughs> something like that. He says he's ready, ready to go. <laughs> bro, bro, they were on the charter. People are trying to sleep. You know what I mean? They listening to music. This guy is running laps up and down the freaking aisle of the airplane. What the heck is going on? He's doing high knees and squats and lunges. What the heck is going on? And 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 not the fact that he did it, but why would you tell the press that? <laughs> All you have to do is say, I feel pretty good. I'm ready to start. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Because he didn't start last week. So people are interested in, in his injury. He has a hamstring. So why, why don't you just say I'm ready to go? This cat's crazy, man. So anyway, Broncos are going to have to go to Jacksonville. Uh, oh, oh, wait. Is this game overseas? Good question, Benny. For some strange reason, I think this game is... Uh... You might have something there because I know we were coming up against a game. And, and I heard they said he was doing all this exercise because it was such a long flight. Wembley Stadium. There you go. Right. Okay. Wembley. This game is in England. So he had plenty of time to do his airplane aisle exercises. But anyway, uh, Russell Wilson sat this one out with a hamstring injury last week. But the Broncos lost their fourth game in a row. Until they get a clue in the red zone and learn how to finish drives, they're going to be really hard-pressed to win games. Now, the Jags are still young. And early in the season, it looked like head coach Doug Peterson was a miracle worker, getting such a young team to presumably gel and, 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 and do so well together and be like a really cohesive unit. Uh, but they've now lost four in a row. And they committed 13 penalties against the Giants last week. That is not good. I would say, other than the fact that the Jaguars that are, are at home I would want to say that Denver could pull out a win here, but they're just a comedy of errors on offense. So I can't say the Jaguars have shown enough on offense that I think that they can score even against a tough Denver defense. I'm going to take the Jaguars to win this game at home. Also with the bias. Okay. 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 You know, Weird one weird stat about the Jaguars that I'm looking at is in the last three weeks they are negative six point seven in net points. Right, right. They're plus two point six for the season. They haven't been playing that great over, over the last. They three did weeks. so well. They did so well early on that they're still in the top ten in net points. But they are fading fast, man. The Falcons have a, have a shot. Let's move on to the Panthers at Falcons. Panthers, one of the more surprising teams. Bias plus score 3.1, however, favors the Falcons. Another surprising team. Okay, so let's first of all give a big shout out to Steve Wilkes, who is the interim head coach of the Carolina Panthers, a team that was one in five down to their third string quarterback and just traded away the best player on their roster. But they toughed it out and got a win against division rival Tampa Bay. I would bet money that nobody picked Carolina to win that game. I, I, I don't remember, and I watch a lot of national programs and I watch a lot of talking heads and I watch these people pick their, make their selections on Friday and nobody gave the Panthers a chance. The yeah. uh, starting quarterback right now is Temple product, P.J. Walker. He was efficient with the ball. He threw two touchdown passes. He had no turnovers. Without Christian McCaffrey, the Panthers went running back by committee, and they gained 173 yards and another touchdown on the ground. Now, the Falcons went to city Cincinnati last week, so they had to go on the road, went to Cincinnati, they got the doors blown off, okay? I just got finished praising the Falcons' run game last week, 
and what the heck happens. The strength of their offense, the run game was completely shut down. The passing game, which was already weak, never had a chance to get anything going. Cincinnati controlled the ball and the clock throughout. Sorry to say, folks, but I think the Panthers are going to get another win in Atlanta against the Falcons. I believe they're feeling it right now. The team has galvanized around the interim head coach. I really believe this. People were saying they were going to tank. They're not doing it. I'm taking the Panthers. Shades of the previous Miami Dolphins when everybody said they were going to tank and the, and the coach was like, nah. <laughs> right. You know? Um, very interesting there. Um, okay. All right. We are, what, what is this? Week eight, this right? Week eight coming up. Yes, sir. Eight coming up. All right. Now, next up, we have Bears at Cowboys. This is where our Mr. Russell assured me that the Bears were going to blow the doors off of the Cowboys. <laughs> his, his cowboy, his cowboy hate is purely fandom fueled as far as I'm concerned. He's it's so it. bad it's like this. He's <laughs> blinded. He's blinded. And, you know, the, the other thing is this. I can really see now why people dislike Eagle fans. <laughs> right. A little bit of success, and it's F you and <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, it's crazy. You know, like it's it, it's like they lose it, they've lost it. And a lot of success. I mean, you got your baseball and your football all, all popping off, you know? Yeah. So very interesting. Here, here. Hey, let's face it. It's the NFL. I, I, who's to say the Bears can't win this game? Okay. But if you pick the Bears in a game like this and you're an Eagles fan, then it's pretty much just like I had to tell a guy at the gym the other day. I don't even know this guy. He just walks up to me because I had a Giants hat on and he starts in on the Giants. And I'm like, bro, your team is playing really well. I'm proud of the Eagles. I know you're happy. Why aren't you talking about them? Why are you talking about my team? Oh, well, you know, y'all ain't play nobody yet. Y'all ain't play us yet. I said, I know that. What's your point? <laughs> Again, your team's playing really well. It seems like when your team's playing well, instead of concentrating on that, you like to down other teams. That's where it comes in. That's where, and people don't want to hear that mess. Brag about your team like everybody else brags about their team. That's what fandom is about. Okay. Now, if you're playing a particular team that week and you want to down, okay, that's different. All right. But don't beat up on me unjustly because I'm freaking six and one, buddy. Okay. <laughs> but don't beat up on me unjustly just to try to prop yourself up. Continue to win. Continue to do what you're supposed to do. I already picked the Eagles to win the freaking division. What more do they want from me, bro? <laughs> I, it's, it's crazy. But anyway, um, so I, I, you know, it, it is we, you know, we are we are um, surrounded. You know, we're in the Philadelphia. You know, we're not homers. Uh, we have our you know decisions on teams made for other reasons and just for the fact that I you know we happen to you know be born and live here. You're right. You know what I always tell them: if I was born in Russia, would you tell me I had to be a communist? You know, right. or, you know, just because I was born there. No, you know, I, you know what they say. No, but you probably would be. <laughs> well, that's true. I probably would. You know, there's a probability that I would be because we know um, all of the, uh, uh, what is the word, you know, the information or the, that they're giving you, you know, propaganda. <laughs> we would have been propagandized. You right. Know. Well, and, and, uh, and a lot of Philadelphia fans, the ones that I would specifically call homers, have been propagandized. Well, let's not talk about politics. Let's not talk about yeah, let's politics. Let's stick to football. Because so, the Cowboys are favored by a bias plus score of six, Benny. Six? That's not a lot. Not a lot. And, and that's again, not a lot. Well, you, know the I compared, had... you know who I compared Justin Fields to, speaking of? Who's that? He wanted to get away from the Trey Lance. No. No. Hurts. Uh, okay. 
Yeah. I don't feel as if he has the level of um, coaching that Hurts has around him, and, you know, offensive schemes and things. Um, but in terms of his personal size, speed, arm strength, all of that stuff, you know, Actual running ability, uh, yeah, elusiveness. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Yeah, I can well, see. I, I kind of agree. I, I must say, uh, well, the first thing I would like to say is I, I got to admit, I haven't been very serious about watching the Bears this season. I didn't think they were going to be very good this year, and I didn't. I, I still believe there's a couple. They're a couple years away from being a team to actually watch, but I have noticed that the new coaching staff is trying to play to Justin Fields' strengths, that being that running ability that he has, excuse me, more RPOs, especially because they have a pretty good run game anyway. Um, they're letting Khalil Herbert get more carries along with Dave Montgomery, so they got a one-two tandem where before they just leaned on one guy. I think that's helping them offensively also. Um, both those things played out on the road in New England all, of all places. Fields had 82 yards rushing on 14 carries, and the Bears totaled 243 yards total on the ground. The defense held Ramondre Stevenson to 39 yards on 11 carries. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that was basically all all she wrote for uh, for the for the Patriots. The Bears actually low key dominated that game. Didn't let the Patriots do anything that they wanted to do. Um, Patriots now. had a good a couple of good hot points when Zappy came in and Zappy you know, came in, yeah. But and after yeah. that, they adjusted and he looked in, and that's when he went Cooper Rush on us. And guess what? The 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 the, the, the Bears aren't known for going, uh, you know, going ham on defense. The Bears have a scary good defense. In fact, if I remember correctly, they're in the top twenty. They might be in the top fifteen. In average points against in our rankings. So if you want to take a quick look at that. So people have been kind of down in the Bears as a whole. I'm guilty of it also. Okay. But it's not their defense that's holding them back. And they they went up and did a job on the Patriots, man. So, you know. The interesting thing, um, <laughs> like I said, what intrigued me was the matchups, um, the different styles that pocket style versus the uh, mobile quarterback style. I, I will, I, I have to admit, I read a study, Benny, um, about, you know, the injuries for quarterbacks. And in the study, they said that mobile quarterbacks tended to be injured less. Right, because they're moving. Because they can move, okay? So um, I still think that you have an issue you know, when you run your quarterback economically, but that's another argument, you know, and, uh, and and it has to be balanced against the risk, the actual risk. Off the top of my head, just not even giving a whole lot of thought to that. A mobile quarterback, because he's moving, remember when you play high school ball or when you played in the league with me, the coach would always tell you, if you're going 100%, the chances of you getting hurt are slim, but if you get caught lunching, if you get caught going half half speed, that's where you would get hurt, okay? Whereas immobile quarterbacks or pocket passers are pretty much sitting ducks for getting hit. And it's not like you're not allowed to hit a quarterback in the pocket or hit him after he's thrown the ball. You are allowed to do that. And that's where a lot of those guys get hurt. No doubt about it. Um... And it played out, you know, I know you talk about it in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. and, and again, uh, it's why I think that uh, Shanahan you know, went uh, as hard well, as. I understand why he was trying to do what he did. Yeah, he wants to move into that realm. All right. I can't blame him. So, Bears, Cowboys. So, so, just about everybody agreed that the Cowboys proved they could win without having Dak be great all the time. That was all the talk last week before the game about how obviously if Dak is better than Cooper Rush and Cooper Rush can win those games, then all they have to do is continue to game plan for Dak the same way that they game plan for Cooper Rush and they'll be fine. 
and that Dak has the ability where if that doesn't quite work for them, if the good run game and the great defense doesn't quite work for them and they find themselves in trouble, that Dak can get them out of it. But they didn't have to open up the playbook because Dak was coming back. Okay, fine. So they go in and play Detroit, which is hands down the worst defense in the league. And, of course, everybody complains because Dak doesn't light them up. What the heck, man? Well, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's that's the frustrating thing about listening to these so-called experts. But anyway, the defense is still damn good. Uh, I think the Cowboys won't have any trouble with the Bears at all, to tell you the truth. I think they're going to shut Justin Fields down, take away everything that he likes to do, and um, and 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 win this game. And they're at home. <laughs> the question that I have is were the Bears watching the Eagles when they played the Cowboys? If they were, they will know that the winning formula is RPOs. The problem is, will they be able to run the ball as well as the Eagles did against the Cowboys? Because it's okay if you put that D-end, uh, like Micah Parsons, out on an island where he doesn't know where to go and he's nowhere near the play. It, it only works – if you're actually stacking up yardage on offense, you got to still be able to have successful run plays. Just because you fool him doesn't mean you're going to have successful run plays. You got to put yardage up. You got to move the sticks. If they can do that so that Justin Fields doesn't have to rely on the passing game, then they got a chance. And they could possibly do. Chicago is giving up 18.9 points per game. Dallas has given up 14.9. But what's Dallas scoring? Points per game. Dallas is scoring 19.1 points per game. Mm -hmm. Chicago's scoring 18. Well, I, I, I don't care about that. So Dallas is putting up 19, and the Bears are giving up what? The the Bears are giving up, so that's the question. Dallas is scoring. The Bears are giving up 18.9. Right. That's not a big difference. So that's that gives the Bears the chance. So I'm I'm not I'm not laughing off uh friend of the show, Mark Russell. We love you, bro. I'm not laughing off your prediction. Okay. Obviously, the Bears have a shot. It's the NFL. I just don't think it's going to happen. I'm going to take the Cowboys. But, yeah, guess what? If they're only giving up 18 and the Cowboys are only scoring 19, guess what? The possibility exists, bro. Possibility exists. And like I said, if they've been watching the Eagles and you know how to, how to, how to isolate that end. Now, the next question is, um, I'm sorry, what's the end name for the Cowboys that we're talking about? Micah Parsons. Micah Parsons. Did Micah Parsons learn anything after being held, you know, uh, done in the way he got or treated the way he got treated by the Eagles in that option? But they didn't, like I said, they didn't even block him. He didn't know who to cover. So he was in, in a confused state. Now, if they coached him up on that and now he knows what to do, it'll, it'll be interesting to see who, who actually learned the most out of that situation. But you're going with the Cowboys, right? That is right. Cardinals at Vikings by his plus score 6.4 favors the Vikings two NFC teams meeting up there. Uh, what do you got? Uh, who's got the bias plus Vikings? Okay. Six. Well, that's probably right. I'm going to just make a little note here for myself. So I have to ask, oh, I got to ask you this question. Is it me, or do you see Kyler Murray forcing the ball to nuke? Since DeAndre Hopkins has been back, does it seem like he's really forcing the ball to him at the expense of the what, other receiver? Yeah, one game? It's only one game, right? It was one game or two games. I forget. It was one game? Uh, right. Last week, they beat the Saints. 
And the week before that, I'm sorry, my notes are handwritten, so I'm not as good as you. <laughs> uh, they lost to the Seahawks 19-9. Did he not play in that game? I thought he did. I thought this was his second game. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I always look at things from a little fantasy perspective. The other receivers on the Cardinals are not getting targets like they were before when Nuke was out. Obviously, he's going to eat up a lot of targets because he's the best guy, okay? But it seems like they're force-feeding him or Kyler's force-feeding him at the expense of the other guys where they're not even getting enough targets to even get catches to make a difference in the offense. I think that's a problem for the Cardinals. Uh, thank goodness for Eno Benjamin. Last week when I talked about their game coming up, excuse me, when I talked about their game coming up, I said I had no idea who the starting running back was going to be because Eno Benjamin, Connor, and everybody else was injured. But Benjamin actually came back, and he made the run game pretty viable. So he's been doing that in uh, in, in James Connor's absence, which is a good thing. Uh, also, thank goodness for the Cardinals defense that picked off Andy Dalton twice last week in the second quarter, or they would have had themselves a shootout with the Saints. But they came through and got the victory there. The Vikings are coming off the bye. They're five and one, and I believe everybody's healthy, including Dalvin Cook. So I got to go with the Vikings. They haven't shown hardly any struggles. The only team they struggled with was the Eagles. They should be fine against the Cardinals. I'm taking the Vikings. Uh, I'm looking here for uh, DeAndre Hopkins. I only see him playing one game that was against the Saints. Okay. Um, and, you know, you bring up a good point, and we'll talk about, you know, well, I'm looking at these quarterbacks who have a dominant receiver, that the person they can lean on. Mm -hmm. Kind of goes back to my whole conversation about Brady and Gronk. You know, people are talking about Gronk now. It's like, yeah, if he had Gronk, you know, he might not. Because he just he helped overcome a lot of ills, you know. And it, it it was a matchup that you could depend on, especially in turnover downs like third and fourth downs. Um, same thing with with uh, um, Aaron Rodgers and Ronte Adams. You know what I mean? If you mm -hmm. had connection, the same thing in, in Cincinnati. You know, between the quarterback and, and his receiver there, that that guy, and, and so it's hard to say that he's throwing to him too much. Um, because, you know, what's too much? Is, was Devontae Adams too much when, when you know, Aaron Rodgers was tossing that ball to him? You know, I don't no. know. So, no, you know, that's, that's the question. Um, he does make a difference. You can see he makes a difference on that offense. You know, he draws defense to him. <laughs> I, I understand that. But we're talking about, I mean, j just to use your example, Devontae Adams was the established Number one, no doubt about it. Nobody else is really doing much except this guy. There's no way you can cover this dude type of guy, okay? Hopkins is just coming back off a lengthy injury and suspension, okay? And the other dudes have been pretty much holding it down without him to basically shut them out. He got 14 targets. He caught 10 passes. I'll give him that. But he had 14 targets. I think Rondell Moore had like three. A.J. Green is basically shut out completely. And I don't know what's going to happen when Marquise Brown comes back, but he was the guy holding it down when Hopkins wasn't there. If they don't diversify there, let's face it, Kyler Murray is not Aaron Rodgers. Okay, D-Hop might be equal to Devontae Adams in some people's eyes, but Kyler Murray is not Aaron Rodgers. They got a different situation there. They need to spread the ball a little bit more. They really do. All right. Well, I, I hear what you're saying. And, you know, I'm never going to say that Kyler is um, Aaron Rodgers, but I'm just talking about having that tandem. That yeah, right. So so he's drawing double teams right off the bat. So why are you forcing the ball to him? The other guy, somebody's got to be open. Somebody's got to be open. No, uh, he was. That's funny you should say that. 10 for 14 is a pretty good percentage there. Bro, well, there's nothing wrong with that. I understand that. There's nothing wrong with that. That means they have to stop them. They're going to have to stop but of, them. But, but of those 10 catches, if five of them are, or four of them are 50 50 balls, 
Somebody else is streaking down the field. You're the number one guy that's always talking about, why'd you throw that when that dude right there was wide open? Come on, man. Right. Yeah, that's what the Cardinals right. don't want to do. Okay. Other teams yeah. can get away with that. We'll keep Other an eye on that. can get away with that. We'll the Cardinals it. can't get away with that. All right. We'll keep an eye on that. Cardinals at Vikings, you're going with the Vikings, right? Yes, sir. Dolphins at Lions. Bias plus score 6.1 favors the Dolphins. Two is back, and Tua runs that offense pretty well, doesn't he? Well, let's remember, Tua is finally coming back after a couple of weeks in concussion protocol. The Dolphins' offense wasn't great against the struggling Steelers. The Steelers are really having a tough time. The defense is kind of up and down. The offense is banged up. Uh, Kenny Pickett's having a tough time. Um, the Steelers only scored one touchdown and three field goals in the first half of that game. And then they didn't score any more in the second half, which was good for Tua because uh, I don't think he was able to get a lot of solid reps in practice coming into this game, considering that, you know, when, when you're in concussion protocol, you can't practice. You can't practice in full. You know what I mean? You come out and you can run around, you can work out, stuff like that. But you can't practice in full with the rest of the number one offense. So that's a bit of a setback for Tua. I think that might have slowed them down, but I expect them to do a lot better uh, this week coming up. And they are playing the Lions. Um, There's not a whole lot to say about the Lions anymore. They were putting up points but they were giving them away just as fast as they were putting them up. Now they're not putting them up the way they were, and the defense is still pitiful. So obviously I'm going to take the Dolphins over the Lions, and I expect Tua to play a heck of a lot better this week. Okay. Going with the Dolphins. Patriots at Jets. We have a division matchup, Bias plus score. 2.4 favors the J-E-T-S. Jets, 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 Benny. Watch out. It's a shame. They lost Brees Hall. Jeez. Jets. So Jets got the bias. I'm just keeping track of who's got the bias here. So Patriots took an L at home to the Bears. I don't remember anybody picking them. Just like I said about the other game. I watch TV. I'm looking at all these shows. Nobody picked the Bears to beat the Patriots. You gave them a fighting chance, sort of, kind of, in your blog. <laughs> okay. But nobody else did. So not only was it an ugly home loss for the Patriots, but they now seem to have a real quarterback controversy. They were joking around about it before, but now it seems like it's really real. Belichick's being asked about it. He can't seem to give an answer. Or either that he's messing with the media, which he does sometimes, refusing to get an answer. The presumed preferred starter was Mac Jones, but he was coming back off an injury. He got the nod for this game, but he clearly didn't look like he was ready. He was benched and replaced by fan favorite Bailey Zappi, who came out hot but soon fizzled and didn't look prepared for what the Bears defense presented. Not the kind of thing that you would expect from a Bill Belichick team. I really was surprised at this one. Um, now, so so in my in my blog where the thing was to look at the matchups between the coaching staffs, got to give it to the Chicago, the young, the young, the young and experienced group versus the older guys, and the older guys are starting to look a bit codgery because. You remember we we when we went through the brain trust early on, and ladies and germs, go back to the preseason and look at our – we had two specific shows. We had one on called The Best Job in the NFL, Backup Quarterback, and we had the other was where we looked at the brain trust and all of the roster changes. But, like, not – you know, he won't, he won't do anything that looks standard. In other words, he doesn't have an offensive coordinator like a standard team has. You know, he had the two head coaches – we didn't know who was going to be calling the plays, who was going to be doing what. He didn't want to, you know, you everybody, there was all coaches. this conversation about it. And people were like losing their minds. And he he just let you lose your mind. He don't care. You know, he's not going to answer any questions anyway. Um, so he took, he took an ex-defensive coordinator, 
who was also an ex head coach and made him an offensive coordinator. Sometimes you wonder, does Belichick try to do things just to prove his greatness and keep his fingers <laughs> crossed and hope that they work? That didn't make much sense to me, but who knows? I, who, I, who I don't even know. One of those coaches that were known as offensive geniuses. Who, Joe Judge? Joe Judge, I would, no, 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 no. Joe Judge is no offensive genius. Not by a long stretch. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> Belichick's more of an offensive genius than Joe Judge is. Again, I think he's trying to take guys and make them great to prove that he can do it. I, I, I have no clue other than that why he would do such a thing. But for them, it's not a good time to have to play a surging division rival who can't wait to prove that they belong. That would be the Jets. Quarterback Zach Wilson was fairly efficient against a really good Denver defense last week. He didn't throw any TD passes, but he didn't turn the ball over either, nor has he turned the ball over, I think, very much in the last couple of weeks. And he did just enough to hold off a weak Denver offense that just can't score. Unfortunately, they lost their dynamic rookie running back, Brandon Hall, that was a shame he got hit on the sideline. I think he's got an ACL. But they did make a trade with the is Jaguars. That, is that Brees Hall? I'm sorry. Did I say Brandon? Yes. I meant Brees. That is correct. His name is Brees Hall. I'm very sorry about that. But they did make a trade with the Jaguars, and they got running back James Robinson to take his place. Robinson was the, the, the number one running back and leading rusher for the Jacksonville Jaguars until they started getting Travis ATM more run. But I think James Robinson still has plenty of juice and he'll be able to help the Jets. So that's a good thing for them. Uh, that being said, this one's not going to be too tough for me. I'm going to take the surging Jets at home in MetLife against the reeling New England Patriots. All right. All right. We have a head coach with some liner roots there. So... I always got to, you know, give him a little bit of. Robert Sala has that locker room in his hands, man. Them guys love him. They are really playing well. Okay. All right. So you're going with the Jets. Yes, sir. Going with the bias. Still is at Eagles. Ah, one of the bigger biases of the week. Bias for a score of 19.5 favors the Eagles. Okay, so if this is if there's a game that the Eagles fans need to be afraid of, this actually might be it. <laughs> I know they're probably going, oh, still a suck, they're no good, uh, but then that's that's what they say about everybody. So <laughs> still is different. <laughs> Steelers defense has been up and down this season, and when they're up, they're really up. That's the scary part. They lost to Miami last week, but they held Miami scoreless in the second half. That actually means something if you really look at the game. They slowed the Buccaneers down enough to get the win back in week six also. Let's not forget about that. People can say, oh, the Bucs are down. Yeah, they're down. Their running game's not looking good. They got a lot of injuries on offense, but the Steelers did what they had to do, and they pulled out a victory on top of it. Now, we've seen some unlikely upsets this season, but don't get too afraid. I'm not going to pick this one as an upset. Kenny Pickett. Still has a lot of rookie growing pains to get over. That's going to be their demise. The birds are coming off the bye. They're undefeated. They're clearly, in my eyes, the top team in the NFC. I got to go with the Eagles. All right. Going with the Eagles. They should. It should have worked that way. I don't see why not. It would be one of those big upsets. You know, I can see the Steelers now. We'd be doing the bias plus buster of the week. <laughs> hey. they win that. Yeah, especially with a big bias plus like that one. You know, I'm telling you. All right, Raiders at Saints. Bias plus score seven favors the Raiders. Now, again, I think both of these teams are in the negative. So sometimes that bias is a difference, but it's the difference between two teams that are in the negative. But, you know, when you got two teams in the negative, that means sometimes you got a good game. 
neither, you know, they both have weaknesses. They both have strengths. And uh, sometimes it's an interesting game. Yeah, that can happen. Who has the bias? I'm sorry. Writers. Right. Where am I here? My list is a little out of order from yours. No problem. Yeah, the Raiders. Um, where do we see the Raiders at? We were a little surprised. Vegas points four. Mm -hmm. Third place, 27.2 points per game. Yeah. And everybody was kind of getting on Josh McDaniel, saying he should have stayed with the Patriots as their OC. That head coach is not a position that he should be handling, but he's trying his best to make this thing work. I know he was a failure in Denver. But that was a few years ago. He's much younger than I think he's learned from his mistakes and he's starting to take the reins of the Raiders here. And I think the players are starting to believe in him, too, especially Derek Carr. So if your quarterback is in your in your in your corner, you can't go wrong. Uh, he's also learning his team. That's the other thing. When a new head coach comes in on a team, he has to kind of learn his team. You know what I mean? It's one thing to look from the outside, looking in and say, oh, yeah, I'm taking over this team. They got this guy and this guy. But you have to be in the meetings with them, talk to them on a personal basis, practice with them before you can actually learn what you're really working with. And I think that's what's going on for Josh McDaniel and the Raiders. So it was a battle of one win teams, both coming off the bye between the Raiders and the Texans. Both teams only had one win, both teams coming off the bye. Neither team is known for the defense. And the Texans were actually a handful for the Raiders coming into this game. But the Raiders' offensive line dominated the Texans' defense, and especially their front four. And Josh Jacobs went off for 143 yards on 20 carries. And he scored three touchdowns on the ground. That was the Texans' demise. That was the strength of the Raiders. They took the Texans' run defense apart, controlled the game, controlled the clock, and made sure that Derek Carr didn't have to throw a lot of passes, although he did pepper Devontae Adams, which he should have been doing. Okay, Devontae had a big game. Um, the Saints, on the other hand, got off to a nice start against the Cardinals last week, and they looked ready for a big-time shootout. With the score tied at 14 in the second quarter, that's when Andy Dalton had a tip pass turn into a pick six, and then on the very next possession, threw an ill-advised pass over the middle, they got one-handed, I think, by Isaiah Simmons, who I believe is a Temple uh, grad, and that went for pick six also. After that, the Saints never recovered. I like the Raiders to go into New Orleans and beat the Saints. Take the Raiders. I think they're starting to feel it. You might see a little run of wins by the Raiders, by the way. And I think if I might have described them as in the negative in terms of net points, but they, they are not. Uh, ah, so, you know. The Raiders we're talking about. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's go on to the next one. Texas. The Battle of Texas. Titans at Texans. By the score, 3.2 favors. The Titans. Oh, let me see. Titans at Texas. Eric Henry. Bias Blues. Yeah, you pretty much said it all right there with that last statement, bro. <laughs> After a win over the Colts last week, the Titans seem to have finally taken over the AFC South. Okay. Anything we thought about what might happen in the AFC South, Jacksonville starting to resurge, uh, the Colts making Matty Ice work and, 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 and coming back with Jonathan Taylor, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The Titans are pretty much proven that they are the class of the of the division. They are who we actually thought they were, or they are at least who I thought they were. Derrick Henry carried the ball 30 times for bruising and clock consuming 128 yards. And the defense recorded two interceptions, one fumble recovery, three sacks and 10 quarterback hits in their game against the Colts. That's pretty dominant. That was a big win for them to take over the division. The Texans, on the other hand, coming off the bye, had extra time to prepare for the Vegas defense, which is nothing to write home about, for real, for real. But they didn't get it done. Davis Mills played well. The offense put up a season-high 404 total yards, but the defense had no answer for the Raiders' dominant run game. And now they got to face Derrick Henry. 
take the Titans. Well, again, I, I was right, then I was wrong. So let me correct it. Tennessee, minus 2.2 net points. So they are in the negative, and uh, Houston is minus 5.2. So mm -hmm. there's your difference right there. Um, not adding in the turnover differential, actually. Let's go on. You're going with the Titans and going with the Bias Giants. At Seahawks, bias plus score of 3.4 favors the Giants. It's crazy. Giants with the bias plus all these weeks. This is wonderful, man. All right. This is a tough one, gang. The New York football Giants are 6-1. and one. The defense is talented. The offense is efficient. And as a team, they are a hell of a resilient team. Hell of a resilient team. A lot of fourth quarter comebacks. People think that's a weakness. It's actually not. It's a strength. <clears throat> now I'm going to give you a hot take, Barry. You know how these people on, on TV say, I got a hot take. Okay. And then they say something outrageous. Okay. Okay. You know who the Giants offense resembles? Who? If you think about it for a second, you'll probably, because you know how I think. Another <laughs> NFC team. The Niners? <laughs> no. The Philadelphia Eagles. Very efficient run game and a quarterback that completes timely throws and gashes teams with the RPO. That's exactly who the Eagles are. That's exactly who the Giants are. Now, obviously, Philly's wide receiver car, wide receiver core is far more advanced than the Giants wide receiver core. We can't even keep three guys on the field at the same time. But Daniel Jones makes the throws he has to make, and they're running the RPO to perfection, mainly because Saquon Barkley is having a career year. Same as the Eagles. Because Miles Sanders is back and he's healthy, he's not nicked up, and he's running the ball really, really well, that's what helps the RPO go for Jalen Hurts. Very similar offense. Okay, okay. The funny, Can you thing, see it? the funny thing is this. Um, Giants, Ravens, right? Right. I was musing to somebody. I was like, who do you think is going to have the most yards rushing? <laughs> Danny Dimes or Lamar Jackson? <laughs> right. Because Danny Dimes be taking off now, man. I, I think, I think uh, well, I know last week he ran for over 100. Wow. Wow. Danny Dimes is taking off. He's the new running quarterback that nobody's really looking at like he's a running quarterback. <laughs> but I, I, I have to give kudos to the Giants coaching staff, the head coach Brian Dayball, and also their offensive coordinator whose name gets away from me right now. I think the RPO thing is the way to go with the team that they have. The offensive line is blocking well in the run game, and they're able to sell the RPO the way you want them to, to make it work. So, again, without a solid running back who's going to put up yardage and move the sticks, the RPO really may not work for you. But they're doing it just enough that uh, Daniel Jones is able to stick it in Saquon's belly pull it back out and turn the corner wide when DN breaks in and he's getting off clean. Nobody's getting near him for 10, 15 yards. Mm -hmm. That's why he's breaking off these great runs. That's the way it's supposed to work. And they're making it work. Now here's the scary part. I have to say the four and three Seattle Seahawks have really, really surprised me at the beginning of the season. Now I remember saying this, I said, if they are willing to let Geno Smith and Drew Locke fight it out for the starting quarterback job, and they're willing to go with whoever wins that job, then they must be tanking for the big quarterback draft of 2023. Boy, was I wrong. Seems all Geno needed was someone to love him. <laughs> oh my it's, it's all he needed was somebody to love him and an offense to call his own. Gino, looking great, bro. 
<laughs> Basically, last week outplayed he outplayed Justin Herbert last week in LA. And all of a sudden, rookie running back comes off the bench and explodes. Kenneth Walker the third ripped the Chargers defense for 168 yards and two touchdowns on 23 carries. Oh, yeah. I, I forget where um, Seattle's defense finished in our rankings in uh, average points against, but their defense is kind of sneaky good. If there was ever a game this far in the season where I might lean toward a team against my Giants, this would be it. But I'm in way too deep. <laughs> I believe way too much. I really do. I think the Giants can win this game. I believe the Giants can go to Seattle and win this game. Uh, I'm waiting for you to just break out and start singing, I believe I can fly. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> I know. That was my cue, right? <laughs> I believe. No, you don't want me to sing. <laughs> Well, I, I got something else to throw on you uh, on this game. I have decided that this is going to be my intriguing game of the week. Uh, good choice. Good choice. Yeah. Very good yeah. choice. And a lot of it has to do with this running back duel that we're going to have here between Saquon and Mr. And Young Boy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm looking yeah. forward to this. You know? Nothing uh, wrong with that. So, you know, and, and again, we I've already, you know, I've already given Geno's his ups and his downs as far as, you know, my my, my um, comments on him. So uh, it's just going to be very interesting. And uh, that defense that they have is a real worrying point. But we'll see if they can get it together. Um, they had a, a short little video clip of uh, of the last week's game with the Seahawks where uh, Geno was starting to get into it with the ref. And uh, yeah, you saw that. Yeah, I saw that. So the coach was able to come in and calm him down and just had Gino turn around. He just took and rubbed his stomach like just that and just calm like, down. Yeah, it's, it's, it's it was great. It, it was great coaching. It was great human connection there. If he had grabbed his ears, I said, Woo, sir. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Hey, look, just real quick, you know, my grandson, my, my Boba Duck. He, you can't wash his face, comb his hair. You can't do anything. He's squirming and moving and fighting you and everything else. But if he's sitting on my lap with his notepads, I can pull his ears all I want. He don't care. Right. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> Talk about Wusai. He must be already into it. 40, uh, 49ers at Rams. Bias plus score 5.8 favors the Niners. Now, you know the Rams are in hard times. My Niners are struggling. People are injured. I'm actually very, very, very afraid of this game, Benny. Um, what do you got on this? Well, despite the injuries, I think the Niners' defense is still top-notch. But they ran into a buzzsaw at home last week. Let's face it, the Chiefs' run game ain't, ain't really nothing to write home about. They don't really scare anybody. I mean, they're pretty efficient. They run the ball fairly well, uh, but 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 they don't really scare anybody. So the fact that you guys were able to slow them down in, in the run game doesn't really mean too much. The problem is they didn't even really work that hard at trying to run the game, run the ball. Patrick Mahomes just went to work on y'all. <laughs> now, you did intercept him once. You guys did recover a fumble, so you got two, two, two turnovers off of them. But you only sacked him one time, and he put 423 yards on you. If you remember, a few minutes ago, I talked about um, the Texans' offense, and I said they had a season-high 404 total yards. Patrick Mahomes put up 423 through the air on you for three touchdowns, not good, not good at all. Uh, the Rams are coming off the bye. They're only three and three. They got a whole bunch of problems and a lot of questions to be answered. 
This might be the game that they answer them, though. Uh, I don't know, bro. This is a tough one. I don't make my picks ahead of time, by the way. I wait until I do my summaries and listen to myself talk and then <laughs> talk myself into it. And I, I, I'm having a tough time on this one. You're but like I did, eh? <laughs> yeah, but but I'm going to say this. I have little to no respect for the Rams' defense, okay? That being said, I think Shanahan with an extra week with McCaffrey and kind of moving his playmakers around and figuring things out. By the way, Kittle had a ton of uh, uh, targets last week. They're finally working him into the offense. He had like 12 targets. That was that was a big deal. They, they hadn't been doing that. So I think this offense is about to take off again. I'm going to go with the 49ers. All right, going with the bias, going with my Niners. Yep. Go Niners. All right. Benny, let me see here. Uh, the Niners. Okay. 425 game. We have one more 425 game. That was the Giants and Seattle. Uh, what do I have up next? The Commanders at the Colts by a score of 0 0.2. 0 0.2 favors the Colts still. And I don't think I've ever heard a coach say to a veteran quarterback that he brought in, you didn't fail us, we failed you. Did you hear that? You didn't yeah. fail us, we failed you. We knew you were a statue when we went and got you. Yeah. We didn't put the line around you to give you the correct time. Kind of like what I feel about with Garoppolo. You know, they need to give him the best line possible, and our line is okay, but they're not great. Um, <clears throat> but long story short, the commanders at the Colts and Taylor Heineke? So, so you know how they always have on Facebook and wherever instant uh, or television and, and social media when so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so goes wrong? goes wrong you know you know how they always do that so so i'm gonna call this when get right games go wrong the washington commanders led by last year's starting quarterback taylor heineke treated their fans to a win over the reeling green bay packers i said last week this would be a get right game for the green bay packers but instead, it actually was a get-right game for the Commanders. <laughs> Shout out to head coach Ron Rivera, who we talked about last week, for guiding his wobbling squad to back-to-back -to -back wins now. The team looks different without Carson Wentz, who wasn't terrible, but he was beginning to look like Carson Wentz the guy that can't seem to find a team he can actually stick with. And I will say this, Heineke isn't setting the world on fire, but Terry McLaurin and Curtis Samuel all of a sudden are becoming fantasy relevant again. Not only are they getting targets, but the passes are being completed. That was something that Wentz wasn't doing. I had Curtis Samuel on a couple of fantasy teams and I had to keep him on the bench because he wasn't putting up numbers. He is now putting up numbers with Heineke back there. So all that being said, I'm going to go with the commanders again. I think Heineke's on a roll. I think the Colts are hurting really, really bad. And we're going to see Sam Ellinger, who hasn't started an NFL game in a hell of a long time, if, if ever. I know he's been on the Colts for a few years now. But I can't remember him actually starting a game. Uh, he may have because I know Wentz went down a couple times. I'm not sure. Doesn't matter. Take the commanders. Guess who's backing up Ellinger? Uh, oh, I'm almost afraid. Nick Foles. Wow. <laughs> and they went with Ellinger over Foles? <laughs> you know what that tells you? 
that tells you we thought we were way better than we are. We brought Matt Ryan in to just game manage us, and we thought we were going to take the division, get a high seed into the playoffs. But we're not that damn good, so screw it. We're going to put him on the bench, and we're going to let Ellinger, our quarterback of the future, unless we get somebody in the 2023 draft, take over. There's no need putting Foles out there. He ain't going to win games for them. Go with the young guy. See what you got. Well, that's look, that looks like what they're doing there. So, yeah. uh, great Ellinger versus Heineke battle at quarterback. <laughs> and you're going with the commanders. Yes. I'm going against the bias, going with the commanders. It's so, so close anyway, based on their past performance. Um, but these are kind of new players, except for Heineke. He did get to play last week. So, all right. I understand it. Well, that wraps up the Sunday day games or the evening games there. The next game, Ben, is the Sunday night spectacular. You ready? I don't know how spectacular it's going to be. <laughs> you got the Packers at the bill. Oh, it's going to be spectacular. <laughs> Uh, I haven't seen a bias plus score like this since the Eagles and the Steelers. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. The Eagles and Steelers are 19 point or 19 uh, plus by a score. Oh, 19.5. Oh, no, no. Favoring the Bills. If it was worse than that, I wouldn't be surprised. And it's the Sunday night game. So get your popcorn ready. Bro. All I can say about the Packers is the secondary is Swiss cheese. The quarterback has no confidence in his wide receivers or his coaches. And the one thing they do best, which is run the ball, they refuse to do it enough. There's no way they win this game. Bills are coming off the bye. This one could get really, really ugly. Please take the Bills, please. E easy win. I'm going to repeat something I said on the previous show and just maybe try to clarify a little bit because I'm listening to Aaron and, you know, he goes on the, the podcast and, and, you know, he gets to speak his mind and everything. Mm -hmm. I think he's really blurring the line between coach and player. Very much so. And I don't think it's helping <laughs> at all. Well, they've been arguing about it on TV all day, every show. I mean, you know, when you start talking about people not playing, getting sat down and all of this, that's not for the players in my mind. You know, that ain't for you to be putting out to the public. I mean, if right. you that's not his call at all. At all, you know? So when you're leaning back, you know, chilling, talking about, yeah, you know, somebody's going to have to not play. And so I'm like, you know, come on, Aaron. So, okay. Bills, uh, the aura, everything's good about the Bills right now. They, I expect them to win Sunday night. It would be a tremendous, tremendous upset if the Packers were able to pull this out. Ben's going with the Bills, and I don't blame him. All right, so that takes care of Sunday night, Benny. Monday night, it is the Battle of Ohio. With the Bengals at the Browns by a split score of 9.1 favors the Bengals. Yes, sir. So Joe Burrow literally went to work on the Falcons last week. The defense did their part by shutting down the vaunted Atlanta run game. But besides that, Burrow was incredible. 34 of 42, 481 yards. 481 yards and three touchdowns. He did throw an interception. Kid was slinging it all over the field. Now, a lot of that, lot of that yardage was a really good yak by the receivers, but regardless, 34-42 is pretty damn good. The Browns, on the other hand, had a chance to win a game in Baltimore, shot themselves in the foot with penalties. Uh, they're definitely struggling, and they have now lost four games in a row, two of them at home. This one's at home also. Believe me, the Cincinnati Bengals are not afraid to go into Cleveland, take the Bengals to win. 
Yeah, yeah. Joe was slinging it, man. He's got his swagger back, don't he? <laughs> yes, sir. How far away from are, are we from Deshaun showing back up? Uh, I think he's supposed to play week 14. Okay, so we got about he should, okay. he's allowed back in the facility now, but he can't practice with him yet. He's a couple of weeks away from that. Okay, all right, all right. All right, well, that takes care of Sunday night, then, Benny. That's I'm Monday sorry. Night. Monday night. Yep. That takes, that takes care of Monday night. That wraps it up for the week. We do have buys with Kansas City and the Chargers, as you stated earlier. Right. So I do like to make sure that I include that in the information uh, for everybody, Chiefs and Chargers, on the buy. And then just to close out the bias plus, Benny, we have we have a buster bias plus buster of the week. How about those Panthers? How about those Panthers? The coach was crying in the meeting in in the afternoon. Yeah, they gave him the game ball and everything, man. It was oh, beautiful. Man. I'm telling you, if there ever was a team that could have just folded. And just said, screw it. Let me just put something on film in case I get traded or whatever. They could have done that. They didn't. They had a plan. They went running back by committee. Okay. They went with, uh, remember old Chuba Hubbard? Okay. Had those good games when McCaffrey was hurt. Right, right, right. Right. And, uh, and Deontay Foreman, who they got from the Titans, they let those two guys handle the run game. They got P.J. Walker playing quarterback from Temple. We've been – P.J. been hanging in there, bro. P.J.'s been hanging in there. You know, yeah. P.J. only he, – he was he was one of those guys that, like, in previous seasons, we'd be playing really well, but then he'd throw that one interception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing up a little bit. If he can keep from doing that. Right. P.J. Can, can, can ascend because these mobile quarterbacks are taking over, man, in the NFL. That's correct. You no, know, they're taking over, and so, you know – um, all right, bias plus score of 29 favors the Carolina Panthers. Congratulations to the Panthers. All righty, all righty. Whew. All right, Ben, let's get ready to move on. The only thing I have to end up this show with is something I just thought was hilarious. You called me this morning. <laughs> Ask me if I called you. I said no, because I didn't remember why I had called you. But this is why I called you right here. I'm going to just play this little clip, and you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Mama, let your kid grow up and be a backup quarterback. The best job in the NFL. Wow. When he said that, I'm like, holy mackerel. We do good work, Benny. We do good yes, work. Indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. When did we say that, like February? <laughs> Something Way like back. that. You've been saying it for a minute crazy I just and we talked about Flacco and how much money how much money he made over his you know when we compared the contracts and all their history and he like he said he made a ton of money yeah but I wouldn't even using him as an example isn't really fair <laughs> he's a former starter I think he won an MVP one year didn't he yeah I think he did he's a Super Bowl champion so he's already, they can't pay him much less. You know what I mean? And and he's still worth keeping around. The guy's still got some juice. So yeah, but but regardless, if you really look, at, all you got to do is go back and look at our videos. We talked about these, these backup guys that have the opportunities and some of them have been around for a good number of years and pulled in millions of dollars millions of dollars and some of them haven't even taken their cap off <laughs> except in the preseason <laughs> they got the cap they got the earpiece 
They got the, uh, the <laughs> tablet pulling in millions. Oh, my God. Best job in the NFL. Mama, raise your son to be a backup quarterback in the NFL. Unbelievable. <laughs> Amazing. Unbelievable. All right, that's all I got, Benny. All I you got, all I got is go nose. <laughs>